MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Last week on My Fantasy Podcast. Can you check your lineup a little bit earlier in the day? If I didn't think he was going to start, I mean, I'm going to sit him there until I think he's going to start. I need that notification. Would you got underground sites I should be going to? <laughs> MyFantasySportsTalk.com. I saw that Marcus Mariota had admitted that he had never had a drop of alcohol in his life. What do you think about that? He's pure, Dan. Yeah, no, I've, I I heard about that in college. I saw him do a couple interviews, uh, and then at that time he didn't either. Um, now, I, I think he might have been under 21, but, I mean, come on, especially if you're going to Oregon, what else is there to really do? So um, <laughs> Try on different Nike uniforms. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> you can just wear your different shades of green. So to each their own, I guess, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't do much for me, especially nowadays when it's just kind of, you know, me, 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 me. If those on video don't know, I'm doing my little kitty cat. That's it's like that's the kitty. Yeah, I was about to say, it looks like Des the Kitty, uh, when Romo the dog first entered your household draft night, join us live right here on YouTube, My Fantasy Podcast, for our live NBA draft show, June 22nd, starting at 6 Central Time, I believe, right, Dan? We're going to go 6 to 9 Central Time, or roughly whenever it yep. starts? Which is 7 to 10 Eastern for those Eastern folks. And what would that be, 4, four to 7 Pacific? Huh? We got all the time zones covered here at my fantasy podcast. Podcast peeps, we're back. Another week of my fantasy podcast from myfantasysportstalk.com. Thanks for joining us live on YouTube. This is our last regular podcast before we start or get into the big thing. The next big thing here at my fantasy podcast and myfantasysportstalk.com is next week, June 22nd, next Thursday night, is of course our live NBA draft show. So do not miss that. We're going to be on from roughly 6 to 9 Central Time covering the whole draft for you next week. And if you follow the site, you already know Dan has a plethora of draft profiles already out there, already starting to work, grinding it out. you got uh, just about one week to fulfill the rest of your draft profiles, Dan. Yeah, yeah. I'd, uh, you know, I looked at the calendar today and I was like, uh, okay, I really got to start get, uh, getting to work. So, uh, I busted out a few today, watching some film, uh, getting everything ready. Uh, you know, I love football so a little bit more than basketball, so it's a little bit easier for NFL draft for me. But uh, NBA draft, we're getting there. I have about 15, 15 profiles out, I believe, so far. So half of the first round, we'll at least get all of the first round uh, prospects covered. At least that's the goal. Um, so definitely check out the site for those. No doubt. Just like football, we're going to do it just like football, but for basketball, that's coming up next week, the live draft show, so that will be hot as well. Uh, Brandon Reed here, of course, along with Dan Schalt from My Fantasy Podcast and MyFantasySportsTalk.com. We're going to bring in Orlando Torres in just a moment. He'll talk about NBA with us. Then we're also going to bring in Ryan Thomas on the show, and he'll talk Major League Baseball with us. And Dan, uh, not to bring up a sore note, but while I'm thinking about it, you, when you took some heat this week with some of our questions, and your baseball crowd is rowdy. But um, before we get into some of those questions, something that really wasn't mentioned is your Astros are kind of slumping. Yeah, well, I mean, it's tough when your two top pitchers, Dallas Keiko, Lance McCullers, are on the DL. You know, you're bringing up a, a bunch of your uh, top prospects, uh, but to throw them in and in there and expect success right away. Um, you know, I, it, 
it's a long season, so you're going to have bumps in the road. I'm not too worried as, as an Astros fan. Even with, I think it's five out of seven we lost, uh, we still have a sizable lead in our division, double digits or close to, um, and we still have the best record in baseball by a few games as well, and that's showing how much of a lead we actually had um, despite the recent slump. But I expect – you know, they're playing it cautious with those young guns, um, and rightfully so. It's a long year, so I'd rather them rest now and be healthy later. Well, and that's that's what I was going to say. As soon as I said that, it sounded stupid to me because you were so hot to begin the season. We talked about that last week, how hot the Astros were, that uh, this, you know, slump that you're going through is nothing more than, you know, any of the rest of the teams have gone through a couple of times in the season already. Uh, so when you start up here, it's easy to get to at least here. So uh, you're still doing okay. But like I mentioned, a lot of baseball questions, and Dan took some heat. I'm not pulling any punches on Dan this week, um, uh, following up on a Yankees topic that we did a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, about a month ago. So uh, Dan will have to answer some questions about that. Uh, so a lot of baseball talk, but we're going to recap the finals, of course. Like I told you last week, by the time we meet next time on the podcast, which is now, it's really happening now that the finals would be over, and it is. It really wrapped up in five games. So we'll talk about that. We're also going to talk about an inter interesting topic that uh, I find really interesting now that the finals are over is what is Cleveland going to do next? Because um, rest assured, LeBron is not going to take this easy, take this lightly, and settle for second place for the next two to three years. Uh, promise you that. So that's the question. What are they going to do? Are they going to sign free agents? Are they going to try to make a trade? Uh, I mean, what exactly is Cleveland and LeBron James going to do next to try to compete with those Warriors who are set up for the next couple of years to dominate? Uh, so that's the big question. And, of course, we got several NBA uh, mailbag questions, mostly relating to the NBA draft, which, again, is coming up next week, next Thursday, if you can believe that already. So uh, we'll talk about that and answer those questions and, of course, get into those MLB questions with our boys, Orlando. Orlando Torres and Ryan Thomas joining us very soon. So we'll do the live draft show, Dan. But you know what I also thought about? Let's get together. What is it? I think it's either Monday or Tuesday night, June 26th, and watch Russell Westbrook receive that MVP award. Do you want to do a live show then? I got plans. <laughs> got plans. Not even – and it's not watching that show either. So, uh, no, you can you can do the solo one, and, and you can just – instead of calling it, you know, the, the NBA uh, – award show you could just call it new breed loving up on some westbrook and then just put that on youtube and you'll get a bunch of views from oklahoma city and i don't think anywhere else well uh, you know i don't get a vote on mvp dan or i didn't vote out of the fan the fan voting is ridiculous and needs to be cut out altogether but so it ain't just me you know if he wins mvp it definitely wasn't because of me he deserved it so we'll see if you're not interested in who's going to win coach of the year rookie of the year any of that no, uh, I mean, rookie of the year, it's, it's tough. I don't want Embiid to win because he barely played a quarter of the year. And Westbrook, I know, will win. Um, and, you know, I've, I, he's grown on me since he's been eliminated and stopped playing basketball. Um, so I'm okay with that now. But, no, the other awards, it doesn't mean much. I mean, did this NBA regular season mean anything? We all knew kind of what was going to happen. It's kind of pointless altogether. And if you rewatch last week's show, you'll see that's one of the reasons why I think the NBA is going down and baseball is on the up and up. So, uh, no, doesn't excite me. Next NBA regular season probably won't excite me either. Uh, as long as KD stays in Golden State, Curry stays there. So uh, it's taken a lot of the fun out of uh, the National Basketball Association. Uh, so several people say, but not to me. Your ratings are up again. Ratings killed it, even for game five. Only finals, not regular season. Okay, well, I mean, people are not stopping watching basketball, Dan. I think we've had this conversation last week. It's uh, NBA has a lot of competition. It's a long season, uh, but, you know, baseball is played in the summer months. It doesn't quite have that competition, but, you know, call it what you want you know but here's the thing it's kind of like the howard stern scenario his haters watch him more and listen to him more than the people who love him because they hate him that's the same thing that's going on with these golden state warriors right now a lot of people are watching these finals even though it wasn't close it was five games so uh but anyway back to the award show say so rookie of the year you think it's going to be joel Embiid or a guy you mentioned when we talked about it i don't know months ago malcolm brogdon is he really the only one else that has a chance maybe 
It has to be Brogdon. He was consistent all season long. He put up decent numbers on a playoff team. Um, I and B just didn't play enough. He, he uh, thirty one games, I think it was, might even have been less than that. It's just not enough time to actually be considered for an award that you know was supposed to be judged over the regular season. So, um, I mean, obviously, if or or if Embiid played, yeah, he played more. He he would have deserved it. He put up the better statistical numbers, but uh, you got you got to be on the court uh, to win those type of awards, and he just wasn't. I was looking at previous drafts today, and do you realize where Brogdon was drafted? It was second round somewhere. Um, it was fairly low, I think. So, um, you know, they got to steal with him, and that's we're going to see a lot of that this year with a draft class this deep. There's going to be those guys that are drafted, you know, in the 30s that turn out to be, you know, maybe the maybe the best player uh, playing significant minutes for his team next season altogether. You know, who really knows? So. Uh, but NBA draft coming up next week. We cannot wait for that. So, uh, But let's go ahead and get into the NBA Finals and wrap that up real quick, talk about that. Um, five games, wrapped it all up. Uh, I kind of had a feeling that Cleveland didn't have a chance of winning any game in Golden State. Um, we saw the um, uh, conspiracy theory, so to speak, about the, the refs and the NBA want this thing to go seven. I never buy into that. There's no conspiracy theory. You can't, because you're not going to ever convince Kevin Durant to not hit shots and Steph Curry to not hit shots. They wanted that ring. If anything, there was a conspiracy for the Golden State to lose game four to come back and win it in front of their own home fans. Now, that ah. I can believe, and that's something that's not really illegal and something total control of the Golden State Warriors' hands. I, and that may, there may be some truth to that, because I don't think they felt in danger by the uh, Cleveland Cavs Cavaliers at any point in this finals that they probably maybe didn't give their best effort in game four to come back and win it in front of their home fans in game five. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't believe they, they necessarily did that. I think it took Cleveland having the best first half of any uh, basketball team ever in the NBA finals to beat the Warriors. And, you know, without that, there would have been no no chance. So it took the, the Cavs showing up on one night to beat them. But, you know, when you're meeting in a seven-game series, there's no way Cleveland was going to win uh, four times. So, um, you know, Dr Draymond uh, Green was quoted saying that he would have wanted to win on Cleveland's home court because he likes to to basically be an antagonist. That was during his whole stupid people from Cleveland speech. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we saw the, who the best team was. I mean, there was there was really no no comparison between the two when they actually stepped onto the court. So um, it was over from the get-go. Golden State knew it, and I'm pretty sure after game two, um, Cleveland knew it as well. Uh, going back to the year before last, when Golden State won their first title, was that not in Cleveland or was it in Golden State? I, I, honestly, I can't remember. What did it go seven or did it go six? Six. It was. It was gone in six. So, so, that, so they. I think they probably wrapped it up in Cleveland in because uh, I'm. I'm guessing. I don't remember, but I think Golden State probably had the best record because yeah. the Western Conference usually does have the best record mm -hmm. over the last yeah, couple. I believe of it games. was. Yeah, so. I think it was in Cleveland, so they 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 know what that's like, and they probably enjoyed it. But yeah, I can understand wanting to win for your home home fans. I just don't think they would have thrown a game for it. Yeah, but but maybe not play as hard, especially if, like you said, Cleveland's having the game of the yeah, maybe, maybe maybe fourth quarter. Although they had some spurts in the second half where they made it somewhat close again. So, um, you know, it was. It was that was the most exciting game, and really the only game I watched for really from start to finish. So. Um, I wish it was more of the games were like that because it was just non-competitive and 75% of the games or 75% of the time they played each other wasn't competitive. Well, I did like, yeah, yeah it, it was, but I did like seeing them close it out on their home floor. Exactly like I predicted. Hey, our predictions piece. Want to talk about that, Dan? Sure. Yeah. Props, props to Newbury there. I'll let you have it. Hey, at least I, as much as a Warriors hater I am and didn't want to see them win, at least I had them winning. Unlike some of our NBA writers who actually believed Cleveland would win. I think we saw the playoff series leading up to that NBA finals. What, who was the best team? And it really wasn't close. I gave Cleveland some props, had them in seven, you know, had Warriors winning in seven. But after games one and two, I knew that was, that was not going to happen. 
Oh, Michael Gomez owes us all money because he had <laughs> he had Cleveland in six. So that was by far the most ridiculous prediction of anybody. Um, someone else had Cleveland in seven. Orlando. Or Orlando, or Orlando who will join we'll, us in a few minutes. We'll, we'll talk to him about that. We'll Thank for that. Um, I think – uh, did did Malachi produce participate in? I think he may have been. The I think he picked screen. Cleveland too. Somebody picked. Right. So I think we, I'm pretty sure we have three people. Some I don't think so. I think Malachi picked uh, Warriors in Dylan, six. Dylan Davis Toronto okay. might have been the the Cleveland. Okay. The other Cleveland. Someone was really close to me. They picked Warriors in six, so we were kind of on the same page. And you had Dan saying the Warriors would win, but just in seven games. And then a, a few nuts picked Cleveland. From, <laughs> and uh, talking to Gomez earlier, I think he was just doing that just uh, for hope, you know. Just you know, and plus no money was on the line. Uh, he was just doing it out of hope, but I, he he didn't even believe that really. So, uh, but yeah. I mean, I'm going to give you all my PayPal email address after the show so y'all can make those deposits because I just feel like I need money. I feel like I need something, some kind of congratulations on picking that because I tried to tell y'all. But uh, So this NBA season is over. Um, do you want to wrap a bow or, or uh, you know wrap it up and put a bow on it and, and, and close it out, Dan? Is there anything else about this whole NBC? Just your your thoughts, how it all played out? Did it play out exactly how you thought it would? Was there any surprises, twists, turns around the way? No, not really. I, I, that's what's kind of the downfall of it. I hated this season. I wish it never happened and it went, it went away for good. I mean, there was just no contest throughout the regular season. It didn't create much drama. Uh, I mean, you had Russell Westbrook being the ball hog and – and getting his triple doubles en route to a to a future MVP, but besides that, I mean, nothing really stood out to me. Um, we all know Golden State, you know, the the true people who wanted to face it. I didn't want to face it, but I kind of knew in the back of my mind Golden State was the team to beat, and there really was going to be no competition. And that's ultimately what happened. So hopefully, um, whether it be NBA players in the off season, start to realize. We're never going to be able to beat this team unless we join forces, and then it's just going to create maybe a couple super teams in the NBA uh, that are going to play off and square off for that finals. But those those teams aren't there yet, so they're going to have to make a multitude of moves to, to give competition to Golden State. Yeah. And I agree with that. That may be the way we're trending, but if you really think about it, that's the way it is anyway. There's only a, a short handful of teams that ever have a chance of winning a title. You always have a, a favorite. They may not win it every year, but there's only a handful of teams that even have a shot. It was that way even this year, last year, before the Super Team. Um, yeah, so but it, it's at least a handful instead of one. Like, I mean, that's – give me that competition of five, six teams, whether it be four in one conference, two in another – that's some type of competition. I mean, even the Cavs in the East, I mean, there was no competition for them. Somebody has to be able to step up, and and whoever it is, I think, will uh, be able to bring that excitement back to the NBA. Well, and I, and I didn't really mind seeing it at all because when you think about it as a kid, you know, whether you play video games and create your own team or you're playing you know, basketball in your driveway with your friends, you fantasize about best players teaming up. And so that's really what this was, and I didn't mind seeing it. I think it was the best team. This particular Warriors team was the best team ever in the NBA, I think, because I can't remember a time when two other MVPs played on the same team at this level of their career and they've won to cumulatively the last three MVPs uh, four all-stars on that team. It was the level of excellence. And I know you said last week, you don't really like the style of play Dan, but I love it. They play defense. They share the ball unbelievably and they can hit threes like globe trotters. What's not to love about that. Uh, just, I, I love it. I thought it was exciting. A brand of basketball and I didn't mind seeing them kill this year. They didn't sweep. They, they did lose one playoff game. So it wasn't like, Total domination, Dan. Um, so I just I think it was exciting. I love to see it. I have no problem with it at all, and I don't think it's going to continue like people say. Uh, I think they have a legitimate shot if they stay together of making the finals again the next two years. But you're quick to bring up injuries happen. It happens every year. It's happened to Steph Curry. It's actually happened to Kevin Durant too. So there's nothing guaranteeing that this is going to be domination for another three to four years. And then, of course, we talk about other teams stepping up. So, uh, But one last point I want to get your take on 
before we wrap up this NBA season and these NBA finals is what do you think it was exactly, Dan, if you had to put your finger on something at Cleveland while they were not able to compete at all? Do you think it, should, it didn't matter, or was there something particular that you saw um, in Cleveland that just didn't allow them to compete that they need to address? I mean, I I wish I knew. I, I don't – I wish I could tell you they needed this piece, that piece to beat Golden State. It's just, I mean, it was LeBron James and uh, occasionally Kyrie Irving, maybe Kevin Love would step up, but uh, they weren't firing on all cylinders like that Golden State State team did. And uh, not even that it was abnormal for the Cavs. They're just they don't pay, play that style of play. But at the same time, they're they're not a half court team either. So they're kind of in that m- middle. Um, and I heard, uh, you know, an NBA. A uh, guy on the on Sports Talk Radio the other day saying, you know, if you put Clay Thompson on the Cavs, then they would have a, a realistic chance of winning. And his uh, his scenario was Kyrie Irving matches up well with Steph Curry, um, LeBron matches Durant, uh, Kevin Love matches Draymond Green, and that leaves basically Clay Thompson and nobody on the Cavs to be able to match him. And that made me thinking: would would that have made the made a a difference, maybe, um, but at the same time, it's not like Clay Thompson was shooting the lights out uh, and constantly putting up 20, 30 point games. So um, I'm not too sure. I don't know exactly what they need, and I think they're gonna, uh, they're probably scratching their heads right now of what we do this off season to be able to compete. So you can either apologize to me now or later, and I'm going to ask Orlando the same thing, is y'all were ridiculing me and laughing me off the podcast when I told y'all Golden State is deep. Um, that that was the factor right there because – No, you said their bench was deep. No, I no, no, I said deep. Starters, their no, starters no, no, are no, good. I never said their that. Bench. Never said you that. said their bench. No, 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 I never said bench. When I said we'll deep – Orlando I mean, when he comes in. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, it, it was my thoughts coming out of my head. Uh, when I, and I never said bench was deep. They, had a, they have a good bench. They do have a decent bench. But when I'm saying deep is, I mean, damn, four all-stars are starting. That is what I mean, deep. I mean, anybody can take over. You saw Draymond have good, uh, good games. Uh, but that's what I meant by depth. But uh, if you want to talk about bench, we'll still talk about that bench. David West came in. They set JaVale McGee for the last two games. Um, Sean Livingston was doing great things, looking like the player we thought he was going to be five, six years ago. Yeah, Pat, yeah, McCall, yeah. Pat McCall, do you even know who that is? Yeah, he has long arms and he tried to guard. He didn't do anything special. None of them did anything special. Their bench was – you can have replaced their bench with any other pr- bench in the league and they still would have won. It, it wouldn't have mattered. But uh, their bench wasn't winning games for them. They weren't even keeping them in games. They weren't doing anything. They were, they were just there taking up minutes so the other guys can rest. You're so wrong about that. They they blew Cleveland out of the water. They they did. They just completely dominated Cleveland. Cleveland had no one to. They Cleveland couldn't even put together a good four starters. Okay, Tristan Thompson was in and out. I guess he plays center for them. They really have no center. Uh, Kevin Love was lost. J.R. Smith got hot in that last game, but he didn't do anything. Shumper. Uh, Shumper was useless. I'm not too. saying they did good. I'm just saying the Warriors bench is replaceable. Anybody can play for that bench and win a championship. I, I think could, that I could come off. Give me. I'll be the tenth man off that bench, knock down a three pointer every five games, and I'll collect a ring. You're you're overlooking the importance of Jerry West. Jerry West knows what he's doing. All of those pieces fit together very properly. Okay, they can all play. And you, I don't know why you dish Sean Livington, Sean Livingston so bad. That dude could be a starting point guard for half the teams in the NBA. Uh, I know he's had some injury history, but he can get the job done. Um, so that's a solid backup point guard coming off the bench. Yeah, I think uh, he's a great backup point guard, but not it, starter. No, he can't, he can't su- sustain that success in long periods of minutes. I mean, I don't just don't think his body can hold up. But I mean, he got decent. his ring. Uh, JaVel McGee is JaVel McGee was better than any big man the Cleveland had. Um, so man, I don't I don't know where you see it, but I did not say their bench was deep. I said the team bench. is deep. They're bench. deep. I said the Warriors are deep. But if if you want to hold me to bench, that's fine. Uh, y'all are y'all are, y'all are overlooking their bench. Yeah. They have great bench pieces, um, and I think they showed that. Um, and I was about to text you when they were going off, but it, it doesn't matter. And I knew you weren't watching. Uh, you were probably watching Brother versus Bush or something like that. Brother versus Brother on tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern, HTV. <laughs> Check it out. Hopefully they can give us some, some 
plug for that, you know. Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> I might even watch baseball before I watch that. Dan, come Astros. on, you know? this is a, it's a freaking sports podcast. Get with it. So that's your 2016 2017 NBA season. Warriors dominate. It's over. Now let's move on to our next topic of debate, and that is what does Cleveland do next? So some of the bigger free agents out there right now. We've got uh, Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, Dwayne Wade is out there. Could you have a reunion there? Kyle Lowry, some of those pieces don't make sense. Uh, would they make a trade? Kevin, a lot of people are saying Kevin Love is as good as gone. Um, some guys you might trade for, Paul George, uh, Jimmy Butler, uh, or do, I mean, do they just go in and try to re-sign everybody and take the fight back to Golden State next year? What does Cleveland and LeBron do? Well, they can't stand Pat because that'll get them right back where they were. They might win the East, but they're not going to win the whole thing. And, you know, LeBron's not going to settle for that if he wants to stay in Cleveland. So I don't know exactly what the recipe is, but they have to do something where there is Paul George – don't get Carmelo. I don't know why that name is even being thrown out yeah, there. Man. I saw that too. That would be so, and someone was really pushing for that. That would be a disaster. Like I, I, I understand that LeBron and uh, Carmelo are friends, but it, it, I mean they play the same position and they both like the ball. And I know LeBron is a facilitator, but it just doesn't make sense. So and you're getting it. You'd be getting an old Carmelo now too. It's not like you're even getting a, a young coming out of Denver uh, Carmelo. And a sad one after Lala dumped him. So uh, who knows, who knows what's going on in his head, but stay away from him. I mean, if I were anybody, I would try and get Jimmy Butler because he's a better defender in my mind than Paul George. I agree with that. I don't like Paul George. I think Paul George doesn't get you over that hump whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, he might, uh, he might make it closer in a game if he can go off, but uh, you know, he's, he's that can't be relied on in the fourth quarter. He's never hit a game winning shot. He disappeared Uh, in that first round and he's clearly the man on the team yep. and he would disappear. So, yeah. So I, I, and Chris Paul, I don't, I mean, what, Michael Wilbon, get this. Michael Wilbon said the Cavaliers should go after Chris, Chris Paul and do a sign and trade with the Clippers trading away Kyrie Irving. Oh. Like right now, I believe Kyrie Irving is a better player than Chris Paul. That would make no sense uh, to get a guy like that. So I, I really, I don't know the player. Uh, it's gotta be maybe a two guard, maybe a big man. If, but that's not going to suit when you play the Warriors in the finals next year either. So I don't really know what it is, but it's got to be something. That would hurt. What if you could pull off a deal and get Chris Paul and Blake Griffin? For Kyrie Irving, though? Yeah. I, I mean, mean Kyrie's the one that's both free agents. But I would have to get two solid, really good pieces yep. to even consider getting rid of Kyrie Irving. I, I think he's untouchable. Him and LeBron, you know, he can help LeBron finish out his career and kind of take the take the torch when he when he leaves. But but there's kind of rumors that maybe they don't get along. I don't know. I will make it work. Don't do a Kobe and Shaq if LeBron wants to continue to win championships because Kyrie Irving's your best chance. You need to find that third guy um, to come in and make an impact more than Kevin Love can. Maybe it's Andrew Wiggins, who they should have kept in the first place. It looks like it. It looks like it. But they were smart to get rid of Anthony Bennett. <laughs> they drafted Bennett, didn't they? Didn't they draft Anthony yeah. Bennett? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, woo. He's lighting uh, up Fenerbahce uh, in Turkey. He's hey. at 1.8 points a game. Good yep. for him. He's playing yep. ball. Way to, way to stick with it. Uh, but anyway, I I don't think there's – honestly, I do not think there's one person out there Cleveland can add to make them bet. It would have to be Russell Westbrook. Uh, Russell Westbrook, dude, I don't know. I can't think of any other player that it could be to really make that impact to put them over the hump of beating Golden State. I really don't think that player is out there. Uh, Kawhi Leonard, but uh, I don't think the Spurs are going to be giving him up. I'm not even sure that does it, uh, and I don't know. Oh, yeah, because Kawhi can shut down Steph and Kevin Durant at the same time. Wow. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I've told you guys before, although Kawhi had good games against my Grizzlies this year, I don't think he's clutch. I don't know. Now, maybe if he's having to share the load on a super mega team on Cleveland, then maybe it's better, but uh, I put him in the category of Paul George. He's just not very high on my list. Don't think oh. he's clutch. Oh, 
Yep. Yeah. New breed. Time to take a nap after that one. Oh. I'm trying to rile up our man who has joined us from the land of San An, the hardest working man on the podcast and in San Antonio. It's Orlando Torres back in better than ever after about a four or five week layoff from the podcast. What up, dude? I was going to say, man, I feel like I don't even know you anymore. It's been so long. <laughs> I <laughs> think look, San Antonio was still in the playoffs the last time we all got together. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're looking a little different, like your little tan going on. Dan's oh. looking good. I, I missed y'all guys. What have I missed? <laughs> Not much. Uh, obviously, there. you haven't changed much. I mean, Kawhi is in clutch. I mean, we're still hating on Spurs. So you haven't. It's good to have the same branded. Orlando, let me let me bring up this question to start off. Do you remember a few weeks ago, or maybe months ago now, when Orlando or when uh, New Breed was quoted as saying the Golden State Warriors have a deep bench? Was yes. bench included in there? No. Oh. Bam. You never damn. said bench? Sit down. <laughs> no, no. You know what? You did say. Yeah, yeah. And that's one thing that we've always brought up about their uh, their bench. Obviously, they did, they did step up in the playoffs. But, uh, yes, that, that was mentioned. Bench. It was mentioned, but that was – that. you can twist my words, Dan, but that was not my thought coming out. What I'm saying is well, Golden I don't State – go what you say. I can't read your mind all the time. Well, maybe you didn't listen close enough. The Golden State is deep. I never said bench. And that's a lot of people instantly think of that when you say deep, the meaning, oh, you must think they got a good bench. Not necessarily. What I'm saying is I like their bench. They got a lot of good pieces in me, in my eyes, but you you disrespect Sean Livingston. Uh, you disrespect uh, Pat McCall, which honestly I didn't know would ever play in these finals, but did a good job. He probably um, won't play more than 15 minutes again. Maybe. JaVale McGee, I told you guys that he'd run up and down the floor on Cleveland and dunk on them, and he started out doing that. I don't know why Steve Kerr didn't play him much in the last couple of games it really didn't matter he could have played him more than David West but anyway you got David West um, but what I'm saying is what I meant as far as depth is damn they start four all-stars that's probably three more than 80 percent of the league has uh, so uh, that's what I mean by depth they're deep but uh, so let's rewind let's get Orlando's take on it wrap up the finals for us what is it it just Golden State's too good, or is there something you saw that Cleveland could have done a little bit better that they didn't since you picked Cleveland to win it all? <laughs> uh, yes, I did. <laughs> uh, Kevin Durant. That's it. Kevin Durant. I think um, I've heard people say that Golden State would have still been a favorite. I, I, um, I think it could have been a toss-up if Kevin, you know, minus Kurt, Kevin Durant with Golden State. But Kevin Durant was the X factor, the plain and simple. I think just Kevin Durant was too much, I think. It would have been a more balanced uh, finals minus Kevin Durant, just with the, the big three of Golden State and big three of Cleveland. Um, I think it would have gone the distance. I think it would have been a little bit better basketball. And I mean, it was dominant basketball. I mean, we saw some good talent, but just Kevin Durant was just, uh, was just too much for, for the Cavs, uh, even for LeBron to handle. Um, I just think, just like we are mentioning earlier, they needed just another guy. And they couldn't contain all four of them at, at the same time. And um, ultimately, just came down to Kevin Durant. And, I mean, it would have been a sweep. They would have walked through the playoffs 16-0 and if it wasn't for Cleveland just having an outstanding shooting night that one night. Yeah, yeah. well, they should have won game three, but, I mean. Yes, they should. That was the best game of the series. I heard someone else talking earlier. I, I forgot who it was, uh, a national radio guy, but um, someone was saying that uh, game four was the best game of the series. No, it wasn't. Game three was by far the best game of the series. Uh, if it's just if you're a Golden State hater, game four was probably the best game to you, but that was a blowout too. <laughs> it, yeah, that's the only one Dan watched from start to finish. It was a blowout. What the hell? <laughs> it wasn't a blowout. It went back and forth. Even, heck, when Golden State's down score. by 25, they're never really out of it. And it went from 16 to 8. I mean, it shuffled into the single digits. It was a great game. It was up and down. It was, I mean, it was supposedly your type of game. You like high scoring, efficient basketball. That's what that was. Oh, I watched it. I'm just saying it was a blowout. Game three was by far the closest game and the best game of the series. It's just the Cleveland dropped that one, too. So let's get your take, Orlando. What does Cleveland have to do to compete? Because I don't know if you noticed this, Orlando, but uh, I was watching, I pretty much watched all the post game ceremony and everything, and watching LeBron James head back to the locker room. You know, he wasn't angry. It wasn't like he tossed his jersey off like he did in Cleveland that year. Um, but he was, you know, high fiving, clapping hands. You know, it was like, good season. You know, we had a good season. I'm not going to hang my head about this, losing to a super team. But he looked like a man on a mission. He looked like he was like, 
all right, I'm going to go find me a guy, and I'm going to be back next year. That's what he looked like to me. So what do the Cavs and LeBron James do next year? I think it's – um they had a guy, just like you mentioned earlier, Jimmy Butler, maybe uh, Pa George. Um, I know uh, there's a lot of talk about Pa George obviously going to L.A., but if he wants to win a title, I mean, Cleveland would probably be his best bet. Not saying they get there, but I'm just saying his best bet to get pretty far. I mean, he's been to uh, Eastern Conference Finals, but never to the Finals. So, you know, that'll get him over the hump joining Cleveland. Uh, Jimmy Butler's another interesting choice, as you already touched on earlier. And I've heard um, – uh, I forgot what uh, sports talk show was, but there was rumors that possibly um, <clears throat> Cleveland trades away uh, Kevin Love to New Orleans and they get DeMarcus Cousins from the Pelicans because uh, they said one thing Cleveland didn't have in his finals was the dominant center. And uh, obviously picking up a guy like Cousins now – um, seeing the way he would mold into a locker room and, and you know, in a year that, you know, how he would work into that offense, you know, it's another question, but those are some moves that Cleveland can make. Um, and unfortunately I think um, this, is, this is just a trend. And I think this is a trend that has started a while back, but I think it's going to happen more than often. It's just the super teams. So I think the question you asked me is going to be a question. Everybody's going to be asking each other um, going into the future. Um, as bad as they may seem, I think it's just it's going to be an era of super teams. I think all these teams are going to catch on, and it's not going to be every team. It's probably going to be like five, six teams in the league, maybe seven. And I think they're going to be looking at what the Warriors are doing, and they're going to try to you know have a counter. It's either they're either going to tank their season, kind of rebuild their their team, or they're going to want to try and go it all. And and you know especially with this max money offers that teams are offering players, I think you're going to see this happen quite more often. Until the talent runs out, there's only so many superstars you can add on teams. Exactly, uh, yeah. Well, going back, and I've heard your cousin scenario too, and I think Kevin Love may be expendable if they're ha- if they're going to need to trade someone to add some talent, some all star, you know, uh, capability and firepower to that team. Then Kevin Love's probably the the piece that's going to go. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking you don't really need to lose anybody. You need to add people. You know, if you trade, it's a wash. But uh, I've heard the DeMarcus Cousins scenario, too. And while I think he could be a beast on that team and fit in nicely because they really have no solid post plays, that I don't think that helps you at all because I don't think that's where the NBA is anymore. Um, you, you're going to have a hard time if you add someone like that still running up and down the floor with Cleveland next or Golden State next year because – Go, uh, Golden State really plays no center. They really don't have a big man. JaVale McGee really doesn't count because he can run the floor and dunk so well. You know, he's just out there to run and block shots and be a long guy. He's not your traditional center. He's not going to back anyone down ever. Well, uh, it's easy to talk up a guy like McGee. He's kind of he, – isn't this guy kind of goofy? Like, he hasn't really done anything. Um, I mean, but he, he plays, plays the game. role. He plays the role well. I love the role he plays. All he does is catch alley-oops and maybe blocks a shot and run up down the floor. That, that's all he needs to do. I think going back uh, for Cleveland, I think they got to focus on their bench. You look at who they added. Darren Williams sounded like a good, uh, like a uh, good pickup at the time they got him, and so did Kyle Corver. But they didn't give you much when it counted. Darren Williams obviously isn't the same. He was a better player in Brooklyn than when he was in Cleveland. Um, Richard Jefferson is getting older. Channing Fry didn't give you crap, and in the finals, um, not sure he played. Uh, maybe one or two games, maybe for a few minutes. And Iman Shumpert as well. Um, so you look at those guys and. You look at like the the points and the, the stats of Kyrie, and LeBron, even Kevin Love was very consistent. And um, obviously, they had, they really had no help coming off the bench to balance that team out. And so I think you got to go look at um adding at who they you know pick up, who guys that can go out on their bench to come and pick, um come and join in the game. So I think that's that's one of their main focuses. You can't keep um I know Darren Williams and Kyle Korver are pretty good names, but um the just the play and the the production he got out of them wasn't there. Well, here's the real problem I see, Dan, with anybody trying to compete with Golden State. And some of the names you just mentioned about Cleveland adding is that you got to be quick. That's the thing. Golden State is out running everybody and shooting threes. You saw many times in the finals where the announcers are like, Cleveland's got to get back. They can't just, uh, you know, lay it up and just mosey on back down the floor. Uh, Golden State runs, passes, they share the ball, and they shoot threes. So, I mean, 
they they can score within four seconds of taking the ball out because they're not even looking to get underneath the goal. They're looking to get a wide open three and shoot it, and they can do that in three or four seconds. So uh, they run teams off the floor. So I think if you want to take them out, you have to pretty much pattern that style of play and get those right pieces to even to even do that. You can't go with a style of like say what New Orleans has right now with two s- superstars uh, with Anthony Davis and Demarcus Cousins, but Golden State will run you off the floor. So don't you kind of have to build that kind of team and hope for the best? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you want to go necessarily firepower for firepower with them, but uh, you need to have defense in mind when you're when you're building that team. That's why, you know, as we mentioned, Jimmy Butler would be my number one, uh, a guy that's untouchable. Like We also mentioned Kawhi Leonard, but like a ty- those type of guys who are good on the offensive end, but you don't need them to be your number one scorer. Uh, even your number two scorer when you have Kyrie and, and LeBron. So you got to get a guy who's a stud defender. Um, even if it's like a a guy that I would like to see on the Cavs, you might not like this, uh, Brandon, but Tony Allen. I would love to see Tony. I think he's still got a little bit left in the tank, uh, and he can give you perimeter perimeter defense, and, and that might be able to help. Um, kind of like a Bruce Bowen from back in the day. So, you know, it has to be with defense in mind if you're going to make a, a superstar move. It can't be one a Carmelo Anthony who isn't going to get back on defense, who isn't going to play a lick of defense. Um, so it's got to be a defender that's that's in first thought. That's a fair point. Anybody that Kobe Bryant says was the toughest defender he ever faced is a pretty good defender. But uh, his his age and you know just, just somewhat nagging injuries here and there kind of concern me about. It. I decide on. Uh, yeah, he'd be a nice role piece, but uh, he's not going to be much better than a Richard Jefferson or provide much more than what Richard Jefferson brought you. And then plus a lot of those Warriors are going to shoot over Tony Allen. Uh, I think he's 6'4". Six, six, um, but anyway, it's, it's a tough team to try to beat uh, a build around and, and beat because, like I said, uh, they do play defense. They pass the ball so well. They're all long and, and, and lengthy and can shoot the ball so well. So I'm just not sure there is a piece out there um, that Cleveland can add to um, get them over that hump um, as long as Golden State is healthy for the next two years. So we'll see. But uh, that kind of wraps up the NBA season. We'll keep an eye on what Cleveland does because, like I said, it looked like LeBron was a man on a mission leaving that arena the other night. He's going to add him a piece or do something. You can bet that. So let's get into our NBA mailbag questions coming up next. You are listening to and watching My Fantasy Podcast from MyFantasySportsTalk.com live on YouTube. You're probably catching out the replays on YouTube or on MyFantasySportsTalk.com or on iTunes or on SoundCloud or on SPN Sports Podcasting Network or on WBLZSports.com. Shout out to our guys there. Whole lot of good podcasts on WBLZSports.com that are taken off, so check them out as well, and their vault on SoundCloud, and check out all their podcasts. Brandon Reed, Dan Shaw, Orlando Torres, uh, all back together again on the podcast after a long time, and uh, a lot to talk about, a lot of good NBA questions here, uh, mostly about the NBA draft, which our live draft show is coming up next week, June 22nd, Thursday night, 6 Central to 9 Central. So, Dan, that would be like 7 Eastern time, right? 7 to 10. 7 to 10 Eastern. Yep, you got it. (laughs) So, if you're on the West Coast and want to check that out, that's going to be – well, that's early. That's like – 4 to 7. 4 to 7. Damn, that's a lot of people probably aren't even off work yet. Uh, crazy Western time zone. But anyway, check us out. Um, you can check us out on YouTube. It's going to be live uh, on the on the um, on YouTube Live. The podcast will be a special three-hour edition of My Fantasy Podcast covering the NBA draft. Um, Orlando, I think you said you will not be able to join us. you got a, a previous commitment already. Is that right or has that changed? Um, I'm trying to get a change, but at the moment I still have a commitment on, on that Thursday, so I will let you know as soon as I get word if it's going to be changed or not. Okay, three hours, man. You can jump on when you can for a few minutes here and there. When the Lakers do not draft Lonzo Ball, you can jump in and share your shock with us because Dan is leaving the podcast. <laughs> I'm leaving. When that happens when the Lakers draft Josh Jackson or De'Aaron Fox. Watch. Uh, but anyway, we'll talk about that later. We got uh, kind of our, our mock drafts and picks that we'll talk about. But uh, as far as these NBA mailbag questions from you guys, let's go ahead and start it up from M.I. Falcon or Falcon, Michigan Falcon, uh, uh, M.I. Falcon. <laughs> 
Mr. Falcon says, really scared about SVG Stan Van Gundy as president. His last few drafts have been a lot left to be desired. What do you see or who do you see us drafting at 12? So I was looking at this earlier, guys. Uh, 2015, they drafted Stanley Johnson and Deron Hillard. Uh, last year, Henry Ellenson and uh, Michael Banaje. Um Three of those guys are guards, uh, and several of them played. I think towards the end of the season, Stanley Johnson was starting. So um, you've drafted a slew of guards, uh, shooting guards, in the past in the last couple of years. So um, I don't know. I, I think you have to go with the talent. Uh, the best talent left at that. It is such a deep draft class. I think when you're talking about picking at 12, you just go with the best talent left or who you feel is the best talent left and roll with it. Because um, I don't, I don't think any really position is, is untouchable on your team right now, except maybe Andre Drummond. I think he's probably by far your best player and you don't get any better by getting rid of him or replacing him. So build around that one piece, I would say, um, I think, but of the guys that may be available at that, particular point i think as the guy dan talked about last week uh frank nicola clean um luke Kennard, zach collins justin jackson i like those guys um i'm seeing you guys mocked by a lot of people um at 12 to take donovan mitchell the shooting guard from louisville so uh several mocks had that going on so i don't know if he worked out for you guys if that's somebody that's really impressed i don't know but he's kind of a small nba shooting guard at uh 6'3 210 pounds uh, i don't know that that really makes you much better um but we'll get into our next question we had a lot of pistons questions our fans in michigan blowing us up this week so we appreciate it so i don't want to give away too much before the next question which i got a lot to say about but um I don't I don't really know that it matters, Mr. Falcon. <laughs> Dan, what do you say? What do you what do you tell uh, the Pistons fans at twelve to do? Yeah, a couple of the guys that I had written down uh, are guys that you mentioned, like a Luke Kennard uh, shooting for uh, you know a possible replacement of Contavious Caldwell Pope if he if he exits in restricted free agency. I have Donovan Mitchell down as well. Um, he is he is only six three, but he has a six ten wingspan, um, yeah. which I do like. He's a perimeter defender, so he's going to be able to impact defensively. And you know, you pair him as a two guard next to Stanley Johnson at the as the three. Um, you you have a solid defensive core right there. Um, you know, with Andre Drummond, obviously, in the paint. So that's another guy. And, you know, a guy that you mentioned last week, um, Brandon, uh, just a prospect that you're kind of keeping an eye on. This would be very early for him. Um, he's he's not – he doesn't have the upside of a 12th overall pick, but he has instant impact, and I think he can play very well right next to Andre Drummond, and that's Caleb Swanigan. He has that post game um, already kind of mastered. Um, he's a great passer. Um, and he's starting to to get a little bit more of a perimeter jump shot. So um, it's a he's guy I scouted a lot. Don't you, think, don't you think he could come in and play significant minutes, maybe even start yeah. at some point in the season for any team almost? I would start him as your as your four right next to Andre Drummond right away. I think he's that polished. Um, you're, now people aren't going to necessarily like the pick right away because he doesn't have the upside of some of those younger players, um, and he's battled some weight issues and things like that. But I think that's a guy who – who can fit their team and kind of help them, you know, they, they missed the playoffs this year after making it last the, the previous season. So um, Stan Van Gundy has said he wants to be a perennial playoff team every year. I think getting a guy who can instantly impact that year one um, in Caleb Swanigan would definitely help. That's going to be quite a goal for them. I mean, they only missed the playoffs, I think, by four games this year. So, And that's actually closer than I thought they were until I looked at it. Uh, but only by about four games or so in the East, I think at 37 and 45 or something like that. So um, they were right there. And if Stan Van Gundy wants to make the playoffs every year, he's not that far off. So um, – you know, our next question kind of leads to uh, rebuilding and, and, you know, which way do you even go with it? So, I don't know. But, Orlando, looking at the draft, what would you recommend for Detroit at 12? I guess it depends because I've heard a lot of things um, about what Detroit would do at the 12 pick, too, because I heard that they might uh, – they could possibly trade the pick or or draft. I guess it depends uh, where the Pistons view themselves because they have one of the biggest payrolls I know currently. And um, at 37 and 45, that really isn't good. I know more than likely they're losing Codwell Pope um, in free agency. 
So, um, lo- you know, looking at guys at 12, I mean, none of them are sure fire. So you're probably going to take a guy like, yeah, like Zach Collins, uh, Donovan Mitchell, um, Harry Giles, Giles, I've heard, being mocked at that position, one of the draft profiles that came out today by Dan. Um, Luke Kennard. So I think um, at that point, yeah, you just go with your best talent or if you, you feel there's a trade and there's something they, they like later on in a draft, I think that's the route they go. But again, it, it depends if they, if they if they view themselves as a contenders. I mean, realistically, they're going to be probably in the seventh or eighth seed. So um, if they can find a contributor who's going to be pretty good down the road, um, I like a guy like Zach Collins. I think Zach Collins should be higher on some of these guys' boards than what I'm seeing, and I think he may. I think he may be drafted higher than some people think because I just I really liked his game last year at Gonzaga, and there's a reason why he's coming out as a freshman from Gonzaga. Uh, really, I, I think he's going to be a really good player. Um, so, but that's kind of what we think about the 12th pick specifically in my. Falcon, uh, but we're going to give you some bonus coverage with our next question because it comes from Rafe. Don't call me LaFrance Turner. Um, Detroit is buzzing right now. The SVG, a lot of talk about SVG. Do people like him? Or I mean, is, is I, I'm getting the sense I've I've been talking to a lot of Pistons fans in in some groups on Facebook. They do not like him. They're actually like there's some straight up hatred uh, for Stan Van Gundy in Detroit. And you know, I was kind of a Magic fan when he was the coach there. I liked what he did, so I'm kind of surprised that they hate but then again i mean you're making all these moves signing all these contracts that's what happens when you're the president of basketball operations as well as the head coach and you're not delivering so i can kind of understand to a degree but you know they also had a rash of injuries this year and you know they've dealt with things like that but i think the the it's probably split kind of 50 50 but those who don't like him like are like the hatred that I have towards the Warriors. That's what they, they have like towards Stan Van Gundy. Well, what a couple of unique personalities both those Van Gundy brothers are. <laughs> you know, really both of them. I cannot stand Jeff Van Gundy on a call. I think oh, I love him. that. Oh my love God, him. that was one of the things I did not really like about the finals. Um, do not like Jeff Van Gundy on the call. I'd let him drag onto my ankle as I carried <laughs> him away. Who would he? Who do that? Alonzo? Who was he? Who was he? clutching uh, himself around back in that day. I don't I don't remember. It's, it's so sad I can't even remember the player. I just have his vision in my head. <laughs> scoot, <laughs> scoot. <laughs> uh, but anyway, all right, so back to the question uh, from Rafe Turner is, Detroit is buzzing right now about SVG. We'll trade uh, Reggie Jackson, Andre Drummond, and or let KCP, Contavious Caldwell, Pope walk in uh, free agency. So this is dumb, right? Or brilliant because we know we can't compete and want to rebuild. Uh, Rafe doesn't agree with rebuilding, but he'd love our thoughts on it. So um, this is what I was talking about, uh, not wanting to give too much up on the next question. So, But I'll say that I'll let you guys go first. Orlando, what do you think? Uh, and that's why when we're talking about the last pick, I think you're safe drafting pretty much anyone at 12 other than a mm-hmm. center because I don't think any of the other positions are solidified at all. I mean, I liked Reggie Jackson you know, a little bit this year, last year more so, but he really didn't do much. I'm not enthusiastic about Contavious Codwell Pope at all. Um, you know, Stanley Johnson's okay, I guess. Um, so, But I don't know. Would you look to rebuild like this or shuffle any of those pieces that Rafe mentions? I think you kind of do have to rebuild. I think they hang on to Drummond and Reggie Jackson. <clears throat> I think, I mean, there's a chance, obviously, anything can happen in the A that they, they're in another, another uniform next season. But I think with the Pistons, you kind of hope that Reggie Jackson, his knee gets better. And Andre Drummond, he actually regressed this year. He was, he was pretty uh, good the year they made the playoffs, but he's actually uh, been regre- he's regressed a little. And his uh, percentage from the free throw, free throw line has been uh, off and on. It's been hit or miss. And um, I think a guy like Caldwell Pope, like I mentioned, I think you have to let him walk. I think they're going to say, I don't know, they're going to save like 20 something million just if they let him walk. And uh, I think that's a guy they could live with letting walk. Um, so I think they do keep Drummond and, and Jackson and, and kind of rebuild. You look at it like this um, at best, you're getting what, six, seven, eighth, maybe six. Um, they're not going to beat the Cavs, um, the Wizards are still going to be there. Depending on what happens with Isaiah Thomas, I mean, um, you know, Celtics are going to be there. It's your top three picks. I'm not too sure what's going to happen with Toronto, especially Kyle Lowry leaves. So I'm not too uh, – I'm not going to put Toronto there just yet because a lot of things could happen with them. But just with those top three teams alone, um, the Pistons aren't beating them next year in the playoffs. 
So you got you got to look at that too, and I think you got to look at for the future. So I will kind of lean more towards rebuilding. <laughs> That's where I'm going with it, Dan. Yeah, well, I mean, you can't let go of Andre Drummond. He's one of the best centers in the league, and he's only 23 years old. So even if you do want to go through a rebuild, he's young enough to help you get through that, and you can still see the light at the end of the tunnel with him. Um, so I would, I think he's untouchable. I wouldn't trade him uh, for close to anything. Um, Reggie Jackson, he's replaceable to me. He's not a you know a franchise type point guard that you can live or die by. Um, you know, I, if you can get a right trade, even if it's not a rebuilding piece where say it's a ton of draft picks and a bunch of, you know, prospects, if you can get another legitimate NBA player, um, maybe a point guard, maybe a, a shooting guard or anything like that. Um, I would do it because it, it might be able to increase the value. And I just don't see Reggie Jackson as his starting caliber, at least in a couple years, he's only 27, but you know, where are the Pistons going to be when he's 29, 30? They're going to be probably, you know, Jackson's game will be trending downward. So I would I would trade him to the highest bidder. Whatever you can get for him, do it. And then KCP, I like him. I, I think he's gonna, he's a solid shooter. He's only improving his stroke. Um, but there's rumors that the Nets are going to offer him a max deal. You can't pay him max. Uh, he's just not a max player. When it's like Orlando said, uh, you may like him, but is he worth $20 million? Exactly. Yeah, and uh, it's probably not with, with the way their roster is constructed. So um, I think you're ultimately, ultimately – well, see, it's making me fall over. I'm so distraught over the Pistons. That's my chair, man. That's crazy. You're getting some li- live-action TV now. Um, was that chair made in Michigan? Was that, was that <laughs> chair in it? Check your label. Was that chair made in Detroit? Oh, man. We had a whole different conversation for uh, M.I. Falcon and Rafe Turner here. Yeah, it, it, it took a weird turn, but uh, I think you're ultimately going to see see them let 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 KCP walk and just build your team around Drummond. If it is rebuilding, so be it. Um, they do have some young pieces, so maybe they can package that for some veteran players. Uh, I don't know, but Stan Van Gundy, uh, the Detroit fan base is getting a little uh, on edge, so he better start to do some winning soon. Well, I'm agreeing with what your guys were saying, that I would hang on to Andre Drummond just because, I mean, if you let go of Drummond, then you're completely in rebuild mode and have decided to try to go after the number one pick next year. Uh, And I also don't think there's anything of relative value that you can even bring back for Andre Drummond. I don't think his market is so that that you're going to come out any better by trading Drummond and getting a piece back for him. Um, and then, as far as you know, Reggie um, Reggie Jackson and Contavious Caldwell Pope, I could go either way. Sure, they're okay. They're, they're decent pieces, but um, I, I would it would not hurt my feelings if they were to let either one of them walk or trade either one of them or one of them or Jackson or whoever. So, um, and I agree with Orlando. I didn't know that number, but yeah, if you can save twenty million dollars to let uh, KCP walk, then you let KCP walk uh, for sure. Because, uh, like I said, you also drafted that boatload of guards in the last couple of years in the draft. Those guys like uh, Daron Hillard and Michael Benage, Stanley Johnson, who could play two, three. Um, so you got you got options there. Let some of those young guys see what they got uh, if they can save you twenty million dollars. But here's the thing: I feel bad for teams like Detroit and even my Memphis Grizzlies. Um, because you have no chance in the next three years. You really don't. You have no chance. I mean, it'll be nice to go watch some games, see some visiting teams, you know, compete, make the playoffs, you know, but you're not going anywhere. Uh, That's the way, and that's the downside, I guess, of these Warriors. But not even just the Warriors. That's the way even Cleveland is built. And the way Miami was built for that four-year run, okay, they made four straight finals too. So nobody in the East really had a chance during that stretch. So, um, you almost have to rebuild, but thinking even about three years down the road. Don't you want, you really don't even, and I know if, if Stan Van Gundy is, his goal is to make the playoffs every single year. Of course, everyone should strive for that. But my thing is, you really don't even want to be really good and peak in the next three years because it's just going to piss you off because you're not going anywhere because you're not beating Cleveland or Golden State. So that would kind of be my plan. If I had any advice, the best advice I would have, I don't know how you do this, but you position yourself to be good in three or four years when after this uh, uh, Golden State run is over and after LeBron is, is on his, um, his last day. So uh, that's the only time any that Detroit or anybody like Detroit or anybody 
the you know 27 or 8 other NBA franchises are going to have a shot at anything. So you're just kind of building right now and hopefully build for the future. So, um, But like I said, you're not bottom of the rung last year, 37 and 45, I think four games out of the playoffs. So you're that close if that's, if that's what you want to do. And it's hard to tell anybody – to not try to make the playoffs and be have an exciting team for your fan base, um, well, like I said, you're just you're not doing anything for the next three years. You're just not. So look to build and put pieces around you. Where in four years from now, in like twenty twenty one, then you're finally peaking. Uh, but who can do that? It's hard hard to predict. But anyway, that's our Pistons talk. Thanks for the questions, Mi Falcon and Rafe. Don't call me LaFrance Turner. Appreciate it, guys. Let's move on and talk about the team with the number three pick, the Philadelphia 76ers. This question comes from Malachi Bigato. I hope I pronounced your last name right. Bigato. Bigio. Bigio. Uh, so one of those two is probably right. Uh, Malachi, who should the 76ers target? We have Simmons coming back, and basically we'll have two top picks playing next year on a team that was halfway between Shush and Shevin. <laughs> um, so what he's saying there is you know, we were you know half somewhere in between really bad and really good so uh, by 76 or standards uh, so the way that you're basically number one pick coming back next year you're basically going to have like the number one and number three picks left for the 76ers next year um, hopefully Ben Simmons is healthy um, but I think Philly's actually in a really good situation. I like Josh Jackson a lot. I think he's consensus number three for most of the uh, most of the mock drafts that I've seen. So, um, unless the Lakers do shock us and don't take uh, Lonzo Ball, then that would throw a monkey wrench into it. But um, I kind of like pairing Josh Jackson with Ben Simmons, and then of course a healthy Joel Embiid. That sounds like a hot team to me. Young. A lot of growing to do, but hot. A lot of super stud pieces right there, potential super stud pieces. So um, you got options, though. I think Simmons could play the two if you need him to. I think they maybe want him running point, but I think he could play the two, possibly even the three. So um, so if, if that's your goal, you could look at De'Aaron Fox or maybe even uh, Malik Monk or Jason Tatum. Um, any of those guys should be top five or six picks. So that combination there just kind of depends on what you feel like best fits your chemistry and, and what's going to best fit Simmons. Um, so, but I like the options. Uh, I like what you got going on there. But do we not have we not been talking about this with Philadelphia for like the last decade or twelve years or so? They keep these rookies and it just never does translate for them, right, Dan? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, they've had a they've had a tough go with injuries, obviously. Uh, but I like I like what the 76ers are doing. And uh, if you're looking for a person to target at the at the number three slot, you have to go for a shooter. So I would have Josh Jackson number one on my board. Say he for some miraculous reason he's gone, um, then I would look at a guy maybe like a Malik Monk, another one who can shoot lights out of the building, and and that's what they need right now. Their, their best shooter is Nick Stauskas. I mean, that's 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 terrible. Um, and they have good pieces, you know, Embiid, Okafor, Sarek, Simmons, um, but, but all those are basically big guys. Simmons is going to be running that point forward, so he's going to be handling the ball. So that's why you need that type of shooter um, that can knock down the three, knock down the jumper, because uh, Simmons doesn't have that good of a jump shot, and none of those other guys are really too good either. I mean, Sarek is decent. He can step back and, and make a three if needed, but um, if you can He brought you some fantasy team, glory this year, Dan. He, he did very well yeah. for your fantasy team. I, I do believe he helped me win a championship over one somebody on on this uh, podcast. Slips me, but, um, you know, I, I like where they're at. Orlando. <laughs> I'll tell you this. Uh, I was all loving up on the Timberwolves this past year. The 76ers are going to be my team moving forward because they're going to be the team that eventually dethrones uh, LeBron in the East if he stays with the Cavs. Not next year, but the, you know, a couple of years from now, definitely. What happened to Boston? Yeah, I'm, I've, I'm over them. <laughs> that quickly, huh? Yeah, they, they're dead to me. Oh, okay. All right. So um, let's go to Orlando. What's up with the 76ers? What should they do with that third pick? Keep in mind they got Ben Simmons, which is basically like the number one pick that hadn't played yet. So just act like you got Ben Simmons with the number one pick this year and you got the number three pick. What do you do? First of all, I like their plan because they know exactly what they're doing. They're tanking. And since 
for whatever Philadelphia's a pretty good market, but for whatever reason they can't attract some of these pretty big uh, free agents. So they're gonna go ahead and tank the season, and they're gonna draft the best available guys in draft to kind of build the reputation. So it sounds pretty good to me. You can't get the big names there. You're gonna draft the best names you could get. So obviously it's gonna be Josh Jackson. Uh, you have to go at three. I think they're in a pretty damn good spot. And for whatever reason, I'm, I'm assuming Boston's gonna take is going to take Markel Fultz, and for whatever reason, uh, Magic say. Johnson and, and the people at the Lakers want to make him 360 <laughs> and skip on Lonzo, well, then you take Lonzo Ball in Philadelphia. And that's maybe a mess over there, but that's not a pretty bad spot. So that's that's my take, because anything could happen. I, I do think Lonzo ends up with the Lakers, but, um, I, you know, hearing Le, 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 the way LeVar has been moving his mouth, that they only want to play for the Lakers, so they're going to win. It's kind of – I don't know, man. If I'm at the Lakers, I'm, I'm kind of getting a little tired of this guy if you ask me. But those would, those would be my two options. I'm here to tell you guys, and I honestly believe this. If the Lakers don't take Lonzo at two, he's slipping a couple of spots. I really think that. Um, Here's the thing. He's going to be taking at two. He's the savior of L.A. There is ah. no way <laughs> L.A. will not be drafted. It's, it's, it's destiny. It is – it's it's meant to be – and LeVar told me, and it, it, I'll tell our podcast audience, in case you didn't check out the site yet, check it out. I have an article on LeVar that I put out today. He's, he has autographed trading cards out now, uh, a deal with Leaf, uh, the trading card company. So you can go buy it, 60 bucks, autograph card, self-inscribed, uh, whatever you want, whether it says I'm better than MJ, different things, but pretty cool article. So check it out on the site and uh, go get your LeVar one. I'm going to, I got new breed too, and he doesn't even know it. They're just going to come in the mail. I actually saw those. those are pretty hilarious. And I, I got a group on actually in my email today for some uh, big baller shoes. I think I'm going to. Oh, group on. See, he's getting advertising deals now with, with other companies. Uh, uh, I'm thing. just kidding. I'm just, I don't no, think come on. Right. We could have kept him going. He didn't know. He doesn't check out group on. He would actually be insulted by that. I am pretty sure LeVar would be pretty damn <laughs> insulted by yeah. LeVar. Are, so, you, guys um, Brandon? Are you guys done? No, we just had to get our daily dose of LeVar. So ridiculous. I guarantee you this. The guy in Tennessee ain't going to find 50 years from now LeVar Ball cards in his nanny's attic that are worth a dime. I can promise you that. They'll be in Buffalo, New York. you got to go north. They'll be in my attic. Saving them, collectors. <laughs> Save your money, man. Save your <laughs> money. Don't do that. Um, so, but, okay, I, back to my original point. I, I do not think Lonzo Ball is the second best player in this draft. Uh, I think if they pass on him, I don't think Philadelphia takes him. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think they go Jason Tatum or De'Aaron Fox. And De'Aaron Fox may end up being the best point guard uh out of this draft. I don't know. Mark Fultz scares me because I had, didn't really watch a lot of them, but it's, it's just the consensus. Everyone says he's number one, but man, uh, De'Aaron Fox is going to be good. Uh, Malik Monk is going to be good too. And I think um, Josh Jackson, uh, I don't know, man, I'm just tempted. I, I, I think Josh Jackson may end up four years from now being the best player in this draft class. You know, what worries me a little bit about Josh Jackson is, and it's not even necessarily anything with him, but another Kansas player who had a pure stroke like Josh Jackson did, Ben McLemore, and where's he been? So that worries me a little bit. Uh, McLemore didn't have the size and frame that Josh Jackson does, though. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he's a lot more comparable to Andre um, Andre Wiggins. Um, uh, Andrew Wiggins, sorry. Oh, yeah. Andrew Wiggins. So uh, we'll see. And it's up for debate how well he has turned out. So uh, we'll see. But I, I don't know. It's it's a lot It's a lot to be determined. But um, it's, it's going to be so interesting. It, that will be the shock. We had quite a shock with the number two pick in the NFL draft this year with mm -hmm. the Bears moving up. I mean, number two for both. To, to draft Trubisky. Yep. Will we have a shock at number two with the NBA draft when Magic walks out there? Or he's out there, and Adam Silver says, with the number two pick, the Los Angeles Lakers select De'Aaron Fox or Josh Jackson. I don't know. Uh, well, I'm you're going to watch on the live draft show. I'll tell our audience now. I'm going to exit the room. I'm going to leave. I will. Uh, I may come back, but I'm going to leave for a little bit, at least to collect yeah. my thoughts. Because if that happens, magic isn't as magical as I thought he was. We'll see. There's nothing saying you got to draft him because he played for UCLA and his, his dad is saying that. Lamar said so. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. 
could could blow up. Uh, I Lavar is going to flip if it's not. I almost want to see it just because of that. I want to see his reaction because <laughs> if he goes to Philadelphia or Phoenix, what the hell is Lavar going to do and say? Seriously, and did y'all watch the interview with uh, Jeff Goodman with uh, Lavar and Lonzo on the couch where Lonzo got to say three and a half words in about ten minutes? I saw the one, I think he was on Jimmy Kimmel the other night, where he said he could be an MJ 101, and that was Lonzo. I was like, what the hell? He was obviously joking, but, uh, man, LeVar's doing a pretty good job at uh, getting his son with that mindset. Look, Jeff Goodman sat down with, from ESPN, sat down with LeVar and Lonzo, and Lonzo didn't get a word in. LeVar is crazy, y'all. Y'all need to watch the interview. I, I posted it on my Facebook page. If you haven't watched the interview, watch it because, I mean, it's, it's very controversial, too, where he talks about getting into discipline and beating his kids and doesn't care if they, he told his kids he doesn't care if they call their mom the, a, the B word, the, a bitch, mistreats or whatever. Treat her any way you want to. Now, he did preface it and follow that up by saying, you know, um, but just don't expect her to be there for if you treat her like that. But what kind of advice is that? I mean, you're still giving the kid the option? No, you better respect your mama um, or else I'm going to beat your ass. So that, that was a backwards crazy. way to get his kids to respect your mama. So It worked, but still, that's that's funky advice right there. That's, but but as, as stated, they never really did sass back because well, – They probably you know, weren't was, anyway, you know, though. It worked. It was effective, and look, they're going to be – BBBs all over the place. I mean, no one said those kids grew up wrong. I mean, they've grown up in, in very nice neighborhoods and very nice schools and were brought up to be respectful. I'll definitely say that. They weren't going to disrespect their mom like that. But still, just to even say that, that's nuts. Dude is on Mars. So, hey, we're going to find out how it all breaks down next week, next Thursday, June 22nd, starting at 6 Central Time, 7 Eastern for the live draft show. We won't have to wait very long because the Lakers have that second pick to see where Lonzo and Lavar go. Uh, so uh, let's drop the NBA for now until next week with the live draft show, and let's pick up some MLB baseball and fantasy baseball talk next. You're listening to and watching live on YouTube, My Fantasy Podcast from MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Brandon Reed, Dan Schalk, Orlando Torres. I do not see Ryan Thomas. Is he having more technical difficulties? Uh, we will see. I mean, we, are, we have reached out, and we are just <laughs> awaiting his presence. But you never know with Ryan. It could, uh, it could be 15 minutes. And we'll go in reverse and back up for him if we have to. Um, but we do have several. <laughs> it, did you you saw these questions, Orlando? Right from the baseball crowd. Yes, and um, <clears throat> uh, Stephen A. A. Voice, I was pretty disrespectful towards <laughs> Dan. What is going on, Dan? I have a feeling. Now, um, I don't know what kind of groups you're in. It's none of my business. But I have a feeling you're in hate some sort of apparently. MLB, yeah, some hate groups where you just like roast these people and they kind of found out that you do this and now they're targeting you. That's just, that's just my feeling. I don't know because this guy seems pretty mad. But you got to get off the New York Yankee. That's trouble messing with them. Um, and you're pretty close there. They can find you in a court, a short, quick car ride trip. Okay, so you need to stop messing with those Yankee fans. Uh, that should be your number one goal in life from here on out for a while anyway. Yeah, let me just say this. I mean, I'll, I'll take all the hate mail and, and everything you guys want to throw at me. I, I'm, I stand by what I say. I was pretty bold, uh, you know, a few weeks back, uh, I guess, hating on the Yankees. I respect their team. I like the way they're building it. I just don't think they're a playoff team this year. They've continued to win, so, you know, it shuts me up a little bit. But I got some, I got some facts that I'm coming back, so – you know, send me the hate mail. Try to keep it a little bit clean. I mean, I uh, I needed to wash my mouth out with soap after reading what I what I got sent. Um, but it also, at the same time, made me laugh. So if you can make me laugh while um, degrading me as a person, uh, you'll get on the show. And that's that's just the way it is. And, you know, I did. You know, I I speak for myself, and I think I speak for the other guys. If we say something, we're going to stand by it. So if it turns out not to be true, call us out. We'll put it on air. Well, we I. I'll eat my own words, but I'm not going to today. I'm gonna to, when I answer this question, we'll we'll find out exactly why. It was actually a, a beautiful manipulation of some twisted words in name calling. Um, I, I like it. I'm gonna start using it. Uh, <laughs> All anyway. right. So I am messaging Ryan Thomason. He again is having 
technical difficulties. He said he cannot get on. Ryan the man. Wait, doesn't he work at a technology company? I mean, he sells phones, right? He he's supposed to explain to people how to use phones, right? Not only that, but when when uh, I had talked to him earlier, I invited him on the show. He said, "That's great. I know I have my phone fixed and working, ready to go." I'm like, "Okay, cool. We'll see you later." And obviously, that's not the case. So might need a uh, reboot. Let's hope his other career as his sports podcast goes a little bit better than his his current one um, with technology, because that doesn't go too well. But back to back Got to a baseball. reboot. Got a reboot. Yeah. <laughs> Got a control all delete on your phone. You know. So yeah, let's get into that baseball. We'll, we'll rewind for Ryan Lee joins us. Um, several questions to get into here. Um, Did you call him Ryan Leaf? Huh? I don't think wow. so. <laughs> <laughs> he may be the Ryan Leaf of cell phone salesmen. I don't know. <laughs> God, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Just take it. Um, so the first one comes from Alejandro Offender. Who wins this? And this is a legit question. We ain't getting to the hate quite yet. But, um, so Alejandro wants to know who wins this trade? Uh, Eric Thames, um, Paxton. I'm sorry. What was Paxton's first name? James Paxton. Pitcher yeah, James, for the James. Yeah. Uh, Manny Machado or Jimmy Nelson from Alejandro Offender. Offender. So it's a, it's a two guy trade here. Um, Thames and Paxton for Machado and Nelson. So your choice, Thames and Paxton, or would you rather have Machado and Nelson? So, um, but I'll go real quick because it kind of hit, kind of really hits me um, personally on my fantasy team. Um, it makes me feel good this particular scenario because I got the I think what is the better players of this of this four you know player scenario on my fantasy team with um, James Paxton Paxton and Manny I keep wanting to call him Bill Paxton <laughs> um, rest in peace the late great Bill Paxton or, or was that Paxton no, no Paxton. Paxton it was Paxton yeah. I don't know. That was Paxton. Uh, um, but anyway, I got James Paxton and Manny Machado. So I think the weaker link in this deal is Eric Thames as of right now. He has four hits in the month of June, excluding what he did last night when I wrote, wrote up these notes. But uh, Paxton's coming off his first loss of the season with a negative nine fantasy performance, but he was 5-0 and up until that point and doing it very well. Um, so I guess I'd really have to go with a better pitcher in this case, which is James Paxton, who is averaging quite a bit more than um, Jimmy Nelson right now. And then just hope that Thames breaks out of this June slump, which is very likely that he will. It's it's a pretty bad slump right now for Thames in June anyway, like I said, with the four hits so, uh, and several negative fantasy production games there. So um, – we talk about big numbers. I think it's you know I'm new at this, but I think it's safe to go with the pitcher. And like I said, as far as our fantasy league, um, James Paxton's putting up and averaging quite a bit more fantasy points than Jimmy Nelson. Dan, what you say? I'm going to the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, Eric Thames is is struggling, and he's one for his last 15. Um, some other f- contributing factors uh, to, to show that his decline is real is exit velocity velocity on his uh, on his balls in play are is down drastically below the league average. Um, his his average is with runners in scoring position is is drastically taking a downturn. So I think you're starting to see the Eric Thames uh, that was in the major leagues you know four or five years ago before he went over to Korea. Um, Machado has been in a season long slump, but he's the guy that I only care about in this deal. I would want Manny Machado. He's going to turn it around eventually, and when he does, he's capable of 40 home runs, over 100 RBI, some stolen bases, runs scored. He won't commit errors. Um, so I I like the Manny Machado side. Jimmy Nelson has done decent. He's not he's not going to go crazy. He's not going to throw those gems that Paxton might uh, every once in a while. Um, but you know, Paxton, I think he was he had all those wins before he came back from the disabled list too. So he just came back from injury, he got roughed up in in, in his start. Um, so you don't know if that's maybe a con- going to be a consistent thing. Um, but I, I have more confidence in Machado breaking out of that slump and being the best player out of these four um, enough to impact your team. So I would go with the Machado-Nelson end. So would you agree, though, Dan, that I probably have the best two players on my team yes. out of these four? Definitely. Without a doubt. Yep. And I've been waiting on Machado to break out, too. Uh, Giancarlo Stanton can pick it up a little bit if he wants to. Uh, Starling Marte can come off suspension anytime he's ready. Um, so, hey, real quick, Dan, I got a sub-side fantasy question for you. I want your take on I was looking at my team 
today. Uh, is it time for me to get rid of uh, John Lackey? Uh, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I, I would hang on to him um, just because I don't think there's a whole lot of other options in our league. I don't know who's available right offhand, but I think I looked the other day and there wasn't many names that popped out to me. And he's, averaging like, to- he's averaging like 6.9 as a pitch, starting pitcher, which yeah. is horrible. Yeah, it, it's definitely rough, but you gotta you gotta have faith that the Cubs are gonna turn it around. I mean, say there's a hot name that comes out on the waiver wire, yeah, I would definitely not shed a tear dropping Lackey, but I want to be confident in that option that I'm getting. So if there's a guy out there that you like that you know is going to bring it, then then yeah, I don't feel bad about it. But I would always have in the back of my mind the Cubs are gonna turn it around, and that'll probably help uh, Lackey's numbers. You know, just alone getting a win is seven points, I believe, in our league. So yeah. uh, the the win should help. So there you go, Alejandro. Uh, Dan says ride with what is going to be the best fantasy producer out of this matchup going, you know, in in the rest of the season, and that would be Manny Machado. So we hope that that turns true. The next question is basically just a general fantasy question. Uh, it comes from Tarek Noob McKinley, and he wants to know: I become slightly addicted to daily fantasy sports on both FanDuel and DraftKings, and the new one um, and a new one called Fantasy Factor. I haven't checked that out. Uh, but any tips you can give me? I play baseball now, even WNBA. Hey, that's something I need to check out. Uh, I didn't even think about that, WNBA. I really had to start paying attention. Um, but uh, WNBA, and if my checking count, checking account allows, I'll be playing NFL this year too as well. So throw them all at me. He's looking for fantasy tips, just fantasy tips in general, not specific baseball. But Orlando, what tips would you give to a noob, uh, Tarek Noob McKinley playing um, daily fantasy sports. Yeah, definitely. First of all, yeah, to watch out with the checking account because uh, that could be pretty. Uh, I don't want to put you into a, some sort of hole into your financial standings. But uh, I guess stick with the um, three dollar games, dollar games, um, head to head games, the games you can play with um, friends and work or family members or just uh, friends in general. There's always um, there's all uh, strategies to play. Um, obviously, you know, the content we put that put out and we play baseball in there. I mean, Dan will put out some great uh, content about draft strategies and, um, there's many ways to play and and it's fun. And, uh, what I like to do is I like to put in like $25, $28 around there, basketball or football. And I like to join the $3 leagues. Um, cause then you get to join multiple leagues, you know, a good amount, five, six, seven around there. And it gives you better chance of winning, rotating lineups, keeping lineups the same, rotating a guy from a lineup, and kind of just go from there. And a lot of times, um, just look at matchups, basically what it is. I'm not sure what his strategy will be in baseball. Dan will, will be the expert there. But I, I tend to stick on a, on a, just um, strategies and um, and matchups. And depending how guys could play, and especially baseball games are played outside, I would pay attention to a lot of the um, um, like weather reports and stuff like that. So, Dan, what would you say? Um, since he's starting to play a little bit of fantasy baseball, start with your fantasy baseball tips for Tarek. Yeah, yeah, that's all I'm bringing. I'm bringing you some fantasy baseball. I'm going to let New Breed handle the the football because I know you you play that a little bit more than I do. I've been getting addicted and to the and baseball. I'm the, champ. I'm the champion too. So yeah, there's other factors you need to consider there, but whatever. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've been I've been getting hooked on daily fantasy a little bit, um, and a couple things that I've learned over my time doing it. Number one, similar to what Orlando said, you have to look at matchups. So what I do, I have the the MLB.com at bat app. Um, every morning, uh, they they play they list the starting pitcher for you know each team and the players that they're facing their their record against them basically. So what their average is, um, how many at bats, you know, home runs, RBIs. So every morning I get up and I look at that. I look see which player stands out. If you know, does guy have good luck against the pitcher? Um, the other day I I had Yuli Gurriel against Matt Shoemaker. I saw, you know, in the beginning of the day, he had a 700 batting average against him with two home runs and three RBIs. Only in nine at-bats, but you know he can see him, and he knows kind of what Shoemaker's pitching. I I played him. He hit another home run. So you look at those type of matchups. If a batter has success against the pitcher, don't be afraid, uh, even if the pitcher is a solid pitcher, to put him in there. Um, and one other um, tip that I've, I've begun to notice – 
Don't be afraid to spend the high dollar amounts on the starting pitchers. You know, Chris Sale or Dallas Keuchel may cost you eleven thousand dollars, and you look down the line and say, "Oh, uh, Francisco Liriano of the, the, the Blue Jays is only six thousand. That's more than half." Um, but there's a reason why they are that much money is because every single start, you know, they're basically going to produce high volume numbers. Um, so spend your money there, and then look at the matchups uh, of the position players. Um, after. So choose your high pitcher who gets the high volume of strikeouts, low ERA, uh, chance to win, and match that with with those players who might, might not have the high name but have success against the pitcher uh, and kind of build your team that way. And I found success doing that. And just a general fantasy tip, it kind of goes back and forth just depending on uh, – how I'm feeling about the particular season and a couple of guys. Uh, but the, I really use this strategy both for basketball and football. That, But I, I try to, number one is I try to have, a, and I'm actually I manually write notes about this, especially football season when it's a little bit more easy, easier to do because the games are all played on Sunday and you've got a few days to prepare. But I actually make notes of guys who, I think you're going to be uh, low value, but really could do well in, in that particular week, either because of number one injury, someone went down, so you want to snag someone up, or um, you know their their dollar value is just not going to be very high playing daily fantasy. So um, it, it just it just depends. It, it, maybe that that third receiver on a team, or maybe that backup running back who. Um, I don't know if you like the guys. You know, we're saying about the matchups. If it just it looks like a matchup where one team is going to blow the other team out, maybe the backups are going to get quite a bit of work. Um, maybe it's a bad matchup for a number one receiver on a team. So look for that number two or number three receiver that might have a huge day. But what you're looking at basically. Okay, so yeah, it looks like uh, we lost we lost our, our boy New Breed, so I think we're just gonna we're gonna keep it plugging along. Uh, Orlando, you and I can can handle that. You think so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We good till Brandon comes along. He'll I know he'll find his way back. He'll come. Yeah, he, he, was, he was giving his daily fantasy advice. You guys, you, you don't really want to listen to that. <laughs> he may claim championship glory, but we all, we know who had the best team every week consistently through the year. So it's okay. Just take the advice that I dished out and Orlando dished out and just, just take that and, and run. Um, we'll jump to the next question, uh, which is from Luis Mena. Um, he asked us for the rest of the season, who would you rather have Andrew Benatendi of the Red Sox or Carlos Correa of the Astros? Um, Orlando, what do you what do you say? Who would you rather have rest of season? Who's going to score the most fantasy points? I think it would be I mean Correa. I mean the Astros have been pretty surefire hot right now. Uh, so uh, I know how do you pronounce his last name? Benatendi. Benatendi. Yeah, he's pretty good. But if uh, I'm um, Luis, I'm going to go with Correa. Stick with the hot hand there. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely with you there. Obviously, I have a little bit of a bias being an Astros fan, um, but Carlos Correa is just going to put up better numbers. He's been on fire ever since May first, um, batting over 300. He has the power, um, the runs batted in potential, and he can score runs because the people behind him in the lineup are going to be able to to knock him in when he gets on base. So I definitely would go Correa um, out of the two. Not that Ben Attendee's a bad option. I just think Correa, the position he plays, shortstop, is a lot less uh, deep. Um, you know, Brandon's term, who looks like we have back here, that deep term. Um, uh, so, you know, shortstop, you don't have those type of powerful impact players um, on every team. So Correa is kind of a hot commodity. Um, so he, he's the guy that I would definitely go with. Um, but now that we have we have Brandon back, we had some technical difficulties. I don't know if Ryan Thomas is with you right now. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Ryan Thomas is rubbing off on me. I just lost internet connection, guys. It happens. Uh, just uh, re it very rarely happens, but I lost internet connection. But I'm back. What I'm more disappointed about is you guys missed my wonderful fantasy tips. Uh, we owe uh, <sighs> New McKinley <laughs> uh, a favor, a redo on that or something, because I had great fantasy advice. I was going to win him a lot of money. But well, good uh, thing I told him not to listen to anything you said. So uh, no, you weren't here to hear that part. I see. Okay, so I, I think you, I think you've hacked me, and you just you press my disconnect button because um, you got upset about the fantasy football championship 
uh, one on you and me mentioning mentioned. that. It's been addressed. You weren't here for it, but I addressed it. So when you, <laughs> when you listen back to the show, you'll know exactly what I said. Oh, yeah, that's going to be entertaining, too. I see y'all moved on without me, but okay, so we're going to move on. Uh, and I don't guess Ryan Thomas is going to join us. No, he's, his technical difficulties have expanded beyond his realm of being able to figure it out. So, yeah. you know, it's usual, per usual. Well, I'm glad you guys carried on without me, and we still got a show going up and running in live. So, uh, appreciate that to you guys. You're you're my all stars. Um, so, but I, real quickly about the Korea thing is, uh, it really is a hard choice to me. Uh, both are 22 and up and coming, really young guys. And of course, I'm very familiar with Andrew Benintendi because uh, he played at Arkansas and it was um, maybe one of the best players to ever come through Arkansas. But really lit it up, and once he got to the Red Sox, didn't disappoint at all, and is still continuing that path. But um, Correa is the bigger of the two, six four, and uh, I think both are good at fielding their positions. I know Dan, and when I turned on, Dan was saying, "I think I'd go the Correas," but I knew he's going to say that because he's the Astros guy, but I really do think that Correa probably has the bigger um, upside. Benintendi can really smash the ball, but like I said, I think Correa has the bigger potential and higher ceiling. Uh, and I, I think I would just feel better for the rest of this season anyway, uh, maybe even next season with uh, Correa on my team as opposed to Andrew Benintendi, who I love too. I just think Correa has the bigger upside. So uh, I missed it. Is that what you guys said too? Yeah. Yeah, we both went. Uh, we both went Correa. So, all of us agree on a question for once, which is nice, Aww. and that doesn't happen often. So we're giving this guy some straight up knowledge. Hey, um, so I, I'm misreading the question. This is another. This is more disrespect leading into our major disrespect. But did you read it properly? Did you call us schmucks, Dan? Oh, I don't. I do not think I. I, uh, I said that he did, Luis. Well, I mean, I, I didn't take that as disrespect. That's. Thanks, thanks for the help, you schmucks. Well, and that kind well, of where's this guy from? Is that a term? Is that a term? It, it is a term. Term of endearment. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I, I think he may be one of those Yankees fans too. Uh, <laughs> schmucks. So then it is uh, pretty uh, disrespectful, right? Uh, no, I'm just in the forties. Yeah, in the forties <laughs> and fifties. <50s. laughs> yeah, it doesn't get as bad as this next one. So. I mean, I yeah. I know that you're still still hearing schmucks in the high schools and colleges of today, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's not flattering, but anyway, it's, 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 it's loving and jokingly. So I don't have no problems, Luis Mina right back at you. Um, but the next one here, the next one comes from, uh, Jackson Borland and Yankees fans everywhere. Jackson is the spokesperson for Yankees fans everywhere. <laughs> You guys remember the conversation we had. It's probably been about a month ago about whether the Yankees would keep up this pace, okay? And uh, Dan said they're not going to make the playoffs. So that apparently struck a chord with a lot of these Yankee fans. So the question reads as this, and I may have to clean it up slightly. Uh, but then again, maybe I won't. Uh, hey, Dan, you nylon-coated asshat. That, that was brilliant. That was almost. That's what I referred to at the beginning of the show. I'm gonna start using nylon coated ass hat. I don't even know what that I, means. I, I think he got that. I've heard uh, Chris Jericho say uh, ass hat before, so I think that's probably where he got that from. I, I don't know. I'm just assuming. But he made it. He, at least he made it comfortable for me. Nylon coated. I mean, it could be coated with something a little bit more rough. Uh, so it's at least it sounds comfortable. So thank you for that. Yeah, it wasn't a, like a Kevlar coated ass hat. Um, but anyway, Dan, you nylon-coated asshat, how about them Yankees? Care to change that ridiculous prediction that they would not make the playoffs? Oh, and Aaron Hicks says, suck it. Edit if you must, biatch. <laughs> Jackson Borland and Yankees fans everywhere. World champs, baby. So uh, you want to backtrack now, Dan, or you want to ste keep rolling full steam ahead with this prediction that the Yankees will not make the playoffs? Sticking with it. They will not make the playoffs. I uh, I don't I don't see it happening. Listen, I I listed out facts uh, a month ago when I said it was kind of an anomaly. I think they're a year ahead of where they are. Aaron Judge is con continuing his fantastic pace, which more props to him. I don't think he's going to be a three forty uh, hitter. He come sets September. the he holds the major league record for a home run right now in distance. Right, Dan? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely. Um, you know he's he's hitting a lot of blasts and he's he's hitting for an average, which is kind of an anomaly. And his in his minor league numbers, he had a very high strikeout ratio. So I expect that to start to become an uptick. Last night, three Ks and four at bats. I think you're going to start to see his decline start. 
Um, but just the Yankees in general, CC Sabathia, who is having a resurgence of a year, um, decided to cut sugar out, no more lucky charms. So all of a sudden he's become a good pitcher again. He's going on the DL. That's going to hurt. Your supposed ace, Masahiro Tanaka, has a 6.07 ERA. Um, you're relying on guys that you're not going to be able to rely on in September. I had mentioned it before, guys like Luis Severino, uh, Montgomery, um, and, and some others that are in there, they don't have uh, the sustainability with their arms. They're on innings, not necessarily limits, but once they get to a certain certain threshold, they're going to start to taper off. And here's the other thing. I, I went back because Borland, I'm just going to call you Borland, uh, your last <laughs> name of, of coming at me. I went back and I looked at every single Yankees game from the beginning of the regular season, and I don't see this mentioned anywhere um, when talking about the Yankees and their great start. Do you know they have only played three teams with winning records? Three. The rest have all have 500 or below. So they their competition has not been very good. The only three teams with winning records that they've faced, my Houston Astros, they lost three out of four. The Red Sox, who they have a pretty decent showing of against, and the Tampa Bay Rays. So two of them are in the division, so that helped boost their division lead. But they haven't played many good teams. So I'm not sold until they start to play those consistent uh, high-end teams in the American League. Even like the Twins, who have a winning record, never played them. Uh, Indians haven't played them. So they still at Rangers haven't played them. They have a bunch of teams that they haven't played yet. So start playing some upper level competition, and maybe your uh, your record will start to decrease. Something not being talked about enough. The teams you know that they're what? playing are just I, bad. I think that's a good look for those teams like the Twins, then, because the Yankees have beat them too. No, nope. uh, Orlando, uh, give us your opinion about the Yankees. I mean, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's not. I guess. I guess from Jackson's defense, I mean, just try to stay, uh, win within your division, right? I mean, regardless of what these other teams that come in or whether you're on the road and uh, teams like uh, um, the Rangers or, or the Indians, uh, you know, if they give you trouble, I guess just stay within your division. Try to keep well with that. That's the assumption I could take. I mean, obviously you want to have a pretty good uh, winning record of anybody you play, whether you're on the road or at home. But uh, I guess keep within the division. But obviously, uh, it's not looking too good to piss off this guy, Borland. Nylon-coated asshat. Let me tell you one thing. Um, so right now, uh, uh, Dan's going to stick to it, Jackson, uh, re regardless. He's going to stick to it um, for the rest of the season. So, But I I'm with you, and I defended the Yankees from, from the get-go. And it was very early in the season, but I don't see the slowdown, man. Uh, sec and maybe Dan is on to something about playing teams with winning records, but I still think the better team is the better team, and I think the Yankees are going to be better teams than a lot of those teams that they're played finally anyway with winning records. Um, second best record in baseball right now, um, Seven well, seven game winning streak until last night. They did drop last night's game, but uh, best run differential in baseball as of last night at 117 plus 117. Uh, the best by I don't know, I think Dan's Astros are maybe second at like 90 something, but it was by a lot. Uh, your boy Aaron Hicks is on a tear right now. Uh, Dan projected that they would not make the playoffs. Okay, so. Um, they would basically have to lose about 60 of their last 100 games for them to miss the playoffs, I think, to get under like 90 wins, uh, which is going to be you know playoff bound right there. So I don't see that happening. I don't see this team falling off like that. Um, they may struggle from time to time, but as far as missing the playoffs, I can't predict that right now. I mean, you're, you're just assuming that they're going to have a major collapse. So anybody can have a major collapse, but right now I can't predict that. I can't say that. So, and I don't want to be called a nylon coated ass hat and I don't want to upset Yankees fans now for sure. So, um, I'm saying go Yanks, uh, Jackson. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go far as world champs, baby, but you got still a lot of games to play, but there's nothing telling me this Yankees team's not going to make the playoffs. So I think, um, I think Dan is just, uh, hating on you because you're in his AL and standing in your, in his way of his Astros. There's not even a competition to the Astros. The Astros <laughs> are so far and above the Yankees. It's not even close. Hey. In Portland, if they meet up in the playoffs, I'll invite you to Buffalo, New York. We can have a chicken wing and we can watch <laughs> the game together. And then I'm going to leave you at the restaurant. With the bill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good call. I love it. 
invite her to a nice chicken dinner and never call her again. <laughs> I will say this: so that was a pretty memorable question, as far as uh, as far as I can remember from some of the ones in the past. Wow! Uh, and yeah, Dan- it, it probably was one of the best, and I. You know, I could only imagine what we're going to receive in the future now after highlighting how great this guy's question was. So, so to the audience, start picking on Orlando and Brandon because I will put those up too. I definitely will. Well, but it was also just a great uh, comeback. It wasn't really even a question. It was making you address something, Dan, because you said they weren't going to make the playoffs. And another month later, there's no indication this team is not going to make the playoffs. I just gave you the indicators. Yeah, you're doing a lot of assumption there, though. Uh, you're just you're assuming that they're going to fall off and they're going to start playing better teams. But this team is good. This team is stacked. But uh, okay, um, like you said, with, with um, who who was who was who went on DL Sabathia? CC Sabathia yeah, so. stopped eating Lucky Charms and all of a sudden he's a good pitcher <laughs> again. Don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see. see. Yeah, we'll mm-hmm. see. And hey, by the way, Dan, I can see that you're watching the Astros game right there because I see the reflection in your door back there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you see, the the Astros called up two top prospects, Francis Marte and um, Derek Fisher. So I couldn't let a game go without um, without having it on in silent. And the Astros are doing well. They're after their little skit against the Rangers. They're up two nothing right now. So we'll take it. Well, there you go. So there's your baseball talk, your Dan hate, your basketball talk, your draft prep. And, hey, I I made up my lottery mock draft, but we'll get into that next week. We'll have a little bit of time before the actual draft picks get going, and we'll kind of talk about our draft picks and the way we see it going for next week on the live NBA draft show. Again, that's next Thursday. We'll be here right at the start for it, live on YouTube. We'll have several people out um, on with me and Dan, and uh, we'll try to get Orlando in here too um, and see the Lakers pass on Lonzo Ball with that number two pick. Uh, Then I'll have to find another co-host, I guess, because Dan's leaving after that. Uh, That's true. No (laughs) joke. I'm not lying. So what else is going on on that website right now, myfantasysportstalk.com, Dan? Um, All the draft profiles, like we mentioned, I'm going to try and get – I want to get at least everybody who's going to be drafted in the first round out so you know their scouting reports, NBA comparisons, different things, strengths, weaknesses – uh, that's something I'm working on. Entertainment section, as usual, blowing up. Um, the Food Network Star. I know. I don't know if you guys are fans. I personally, I'm a fan of Food Network Star. It's on the Food Network, and they try and find stars for their network. Well, we have a fan of the site who's actually a contestant on that show. Um, he's uh, very good friends with one of our writers, Jamie Nixon, and they, he's been interviewed a few times. Uh, he, he stays in contact daily and keeps up with the site. So his name is Jason Smith, a uh, contestant on Food Network Star. I wanted to give a shout-out to, to him, and and thanks for, for showing some love. Now just mention us uh, while you're recording, although it's probably already recorded. Um, but give us some love, but shout-out to, to them in the entertainment section. Uh, props to Orlando. He's busting out a lot of fantasy football pieces. Uh, he brought out a seven running back list, uh, you know, if you decide to go wide receiver heavy. Um, in the beginning of your draft, seven running backs that you should look to target. Uh, I mean, he's got Marshawn Lynch on there, so just stay away from that one. But uh, That's what I was telling you guys a month or so ago about Eddie Lacy, too. That's what I'm talking about. If you go wide receiver heavy, I could see drafting an Eddie Lacy or someone like that in the as high as the fourth round. And that's exactly what Orlando was talking about. And you guys, you'll want to join our league with with Brandon and Orlando with those type of picks. So um, definitely look out. I got out my title. For that. I got my title. It's on you guys now. I got my title. <laughs> so, but but check out check out the fantasy uh, the the NFL section for those fantasy pieces. Um, yeah, and then just just NBA draft show next week. I'm getting ready for it. I can't wait. Uh, looking forward to it. And the site's popping. Um, make sure to subscribe to us on, on YouTube, like the little thing below. Um, more subscribers, the better, and you'll get updated of when our sh- live shows uh, are airing. So it's, it's even better. You can see us live. So we never know from week to week on a typical podcast when exactly we're going to air. We're typically around 6 to 6.30 Central Time, but we never know exactly what day because we try to get as many people together as we can to actually join the podcast. So you never know. But I can promise you what the time and place is going to be next week. It's going to be next Thursday at 6 Central Time for the live NBA draft show 
on our YouTube page. So check it out. The link is already up there. You can follow that bookmark it, like I said before, and um, and get ready for it. Get uh, ready to watch the shock and all along with us of the NBA draft and see how these NBA franchises are going to be shaped and shifted and changed and what trades may occur uh, and all that right along with us next week. So uh, YouTube, check us out on iTunes, check out, check us out on SoundCloud, check us out SPN Sports Podcasting Network, WBLZ, WBLZSports.com and all their podcasts. And of course, check out the website daily, MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Why go anywhere else for sports and entertainment? So, uh, Ryan Thomas, maybe next time we'll join you. Sorry for the technical difficulties on your your end and my end as well. So, uh, we'll catch up to Ryan next time. But for Orlando Torres and Dan Schalk, I am Brandon Reed. See you next week. Live NBA Draft Show, 6 Central Time, right here on our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us. Later. Peace.